All righty, here we go. Let me give it a couple seconds. I know there's a couple of different platforms. People are logging in by, so a few of you are not able to use the Crowdcast. Um, so we've got a couple of different platforms that are kind of easing easing their way in. So uh, this month, um, August, uh, we're going to jump in and tackle some of the live questions that came in through Patreon. So we've got about eight or 10 of those um, that we're going to tackle. And then if there are any additional questions, you can feel free to use the chat on the side, chat with one another. I mean, obviously, I, I am not an encyclopedia. So there are a lot of times I do have to Google information. Um, I use the game show strategy a lot of phoning a friend. Um, I've got five or six, seven, eight, nine you know, permaculture friends that I'm constantly asking questions, you know, because sometimes it's a matter of getting a view from a different perspective and thinking outside of the box um, a little bit. So uh, if you do have insight of things that I am not sharing or another perspective, please, please, please feel free to share those in the chat. And I will try and follow along with the chat there on the side. Uh, we'll try and keep tonight's broadcast uh, to about 30 minutes. If we've ever met before, probably going to be 45 because <laughs> your boy talks a lot. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so I want to jump into some of these Patreon uh, questions first. Uh, and then if there are other people that are uh, joining in or if you have additional questions, we can start taking a look at those. Um, so the first question that I got uh, messaged in Patreon is about the top five things from the big car, uh, gardening calendar, what are the top five things that I would recommend doing, you know, now? Um, and so for me, I've kind of consolidated these um, into one, two, three, or five really fast. Um, so the first thing that I would do is I would really focus on those last minute plants to get in the ground, especially the perennials that are going to be more uh, cold sensitive and need the winter protection. Um, so if you're in zones three through eight, this time of year when I lived in Kansas City, when I lived in Missouri, I'm thinking along the lines of the berry bushes, um, getting those in the ground because they're the stems are thinner, the trunks of the bushes are are thinner, and they're just a little more susceptible to getting bit by that frost and the cold. Um, so think along the lines of gooseberries and currants, uh, linion berries, blackberries, and raspberries. Those are the things I'm really trying to get in the ground right now if I'm in the Midwest. Now, if you're in a Midwest region that is getting a lot of rain, by all means, keep planting, keep planting, mulch really, really well, and you're going to be fine. Um, if you're in zones 9 through 11, this is like the last, we'll just say appropriate time or the the wise time to do things like avocados, mangoes, strawberry tree, the things that really need time to root in. This is the last month, even the next like, two weeks till August 15th. This is the real time to go, all right, if I'm getting an avocado tree in this year, it's now or never. If we're honest, I think I planted a mango tree. I did an ice cream mango last year in October. Now, it did get bit a little bit in the frost, but it came back. It was all right. So if you want to like, you know, really press it, you've got another month or two that you can do that in zone nine through 11. But the wise time is really like right now is when you want to be like getting stuff um, in the ground um, if you're in those cold sensitive areas. Uh, second thing that I would do this time of year, if, you know, we're boiling this down to the top five things for August, I would be watching for like fungal and humidity related issues. So things like sooty mold or powdery mildew, you know, those things that can creep up really fast. Now, when those things are like just getting started, you can usually get them under control by just snipping and clipping and just, you know, don't throw them in your compost pile because you'll spread it next year, but throw it in the, um, in the campfire pit or just throw it in the garbage. Um, that's probably what I'm going to be looking for. If you're, Fungal issues are really out of control. You're probably going to have to do a spray, like a basic H and neem um, kind of deal. Neem is like my number one for insects and fungal. That's kind of my go-to. Um, and then as far as the watering this time of year, this really depends on where you're at because all 
zone nine are not the same. So the Florida zone nine is very, very different than California zone nine. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later when we get into some of the pruning um, questions. The like California zone nine can be very dry this time of year. Now in Florida, it is rain in buckets and it's like an every day it's raining kind of thing. So just really be watching the watering scenario. I always use the finger test. So it's just like when you do like brownies and you put a toothpick in the brownie. So if you take your finger, put it in the soil. I mean, obviously move your wood chips back, put it in the soil. If it's moist, don't water. It doesn't matter if it's been three weeks and you haven't watered. If the soil's moist, it doesn't need it. It, it. That just means that you've wood chipped enough and your wood chips are retaining that moisture. Um, you know, so, so don't water. If it's dry, I wait for another day or two until the plants kind of start to faint. You know, when the leaves kind of start sagging down, when you start seeing those leaves sag, that does mean the plant is thirsty. But don't think you have to water immediately the moment you see the plant starting to faint a little bit, because all that means is the energy is going from the top down into the root system. So it's developing deeper roots. So if you water the moment your plants start to do this, then you're never allowing that plant to produce the roots that it needs to go get water on its own. And I don't want to be responsible for the root systems of all of my dang plants. I need them to fend for themselves, to be strong, to be courageous, and to go get their freaking water on their own. Um, so for me, finger test, always wait a day or two if it's dry. Now, if things start to crisp, you're too late in watering. I mean, water immediately. Um, so then number three, third thing that I would do this time of year, it's an amazing time to deworm, whether that is livestock or horses or um, goats or sheep or chickens, dogs, whatever it happens to be. Um, I like to do natural dewormers. Uh, Basic H is my preference of choice, not H2. Is, H2 does work, but it's not as good. So I buy it in the five gallon bucket um, version um, because farm life, I use it for everything. I clean my coops and my sheds and my barn and you know, water plants so that I do, you know, pretty much everything with basic H. Uh, but yeah, deworming this time of year, I think is especially important because it's so moist and so humid in a lot of cli uh, climates and the soil is moist. That's where a lot of those worms and the parasites that are going to affect our animals are coming into play. It's the bordetella and the ringworm, uh, hookworm, roundworm, gapeworm, all the worms, all the worms. So this is the time of year to do your deworming. Um, and then I always follow up uh, with probiotics uh, as well. Number four, clean, deep clean, clean and deep clean. This is especially important in barns, in chicken coops, in stables. Uh, always choose a day <clears throat> that's not just warm, but has really good airflow. You want the wind to be really blowing, turn some fans on, air it out. Do not close the barn up, the stable up, the chicken coop up, the duck house up. Do not close that up if it's not windy enough or if it's not 100% dry. Um, you're just going to have mold issues. And so make sure you leave it open to really, really air out um, and do its thing. So great time to be deep cleaning sheds, barns, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then number five, the, the fifth thing that I'm doing this time of year is I'm getting ready to do my fall crops. Now, these are going to be very different in zones three through eight, because you guys are thinking along the lines of beets and turnips and diac and radishes, kale, cabbage, some more rounds of the brassica family, lettuces, Swiss chard. So that's what you're probably thinking in zones three through eight. Now, zones nine through 11, we're thinking more nightshades. So we're doing tomatoes, tomatillos, eggplants, uh, peppers, um, uh, ground cherries. So we're doing more of the nightshades because we've still got a couple months that are like slamming us with the summer heat. Um, so right now I'm literally doing like a flat of plants like every day or every other day. Uh, because one, I don't want all of my tomatoes ripe the same day. Um, number two, if there's a pest, they're going to attack the same kind of age usually. So I don't want to lose all of one crop. So I'm kind of staggering my plantings just to diversify a little bit. So like yesterday I did, oh, what did I do? Lollipop tomatoes, Everglade tomatoes, Black Beauty. 
Then I did a round of Cap 455 peppers that I got from Josh Jameson at Cody Cove. Love those. And then I did some more Cosmos and Xenia. So this time of year, oh, speaking of Cosmos and Xenia, right now is when you want to be planting your um, decorative flowers if you want them during the holidays in like October, November. So if you want, you know, those fall kind of vibes or whatever, this is when you want to start doing that. And again, with those, I stagger. So I'm doing a thing of Xenia's, thing of Cosmos, thing of Sunflower, a thing of Coleus pretty much every single week till the end of August. Cause a lot of those are like 60 days until they flower. Some sunflowers are going to be three months. So if you want those like fall flowers for the table on Thanksgiving, this is your time to be getting those kind of fall decorative flowers in the ground. Now you can get real nerdy. Like I usually do. I get on, on like either Etsy or whatever. And I just start creating a collage of the color scheme that I want. So last year I did like uh, burgundy and pink. And this year I'm doing more like peaches and cream um, kind of thing. A little bit of like pink and yellow or whatever in there. Uh, apricot, lemonade, cosmos. I'm really excited about those. Uh, queen lime, zinnias. I'm doing really deep burgundy sunflowers. Uh, the uh, Moulin Rouge uh, sunflower. So I'm pretty excited about those. So those are my top five. Again, those are last window for cold sensitive. Watch for fungal issues. Deworming livestock. Uh, cleaning out coops and barns, and then last is the fall crops. So the second question that came in through Patreon is how do we deal with scale and mealy bugs in the food forest? Now, in general, a little bit of that is okay. To be honest, I think, I think a lot of times, I mean, I used to freak out. If I saw a scale or a mealy bug, I'm like freaking out. I'm stressed out. I'm getting on Google. I'm using Google Lens. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. A little bit of that is fine. It's part of an ecosystem. You know, real boats rock. Fake boats, not so rocky, you know. And so if you're out at sea, expect a little bit of turbulence. If you're in an ecosystem, there's going to be bugs. There's going to be rodents. There's going to be snakes. There's going to be insects. There's going to be songbirds. There's going to be, going to be, going to be. And honestly, there kind of should be. That, that is part of a balanced ecosystem. Now, if it gets out of balance, then we get to be active participants to swing nature back into balance and help it kind of come back into homeostasis. Because the reality is your property was probably not in a natural balance unless you moved into a property on an old growth rainforest. It was probably out of balance anyway. It was probably in suburbia. It was all monoculture, grass. You know, and so it's a process to bring that back into harmony with nature. So if it is out of balance, I always recommend starting with the soil first. So focus on nutrients. Um, jump into compost, lots of compost. Now in zones 9 through 11, we can compost any month out of the year, no problem. If you're in zones 3 through 8, your composting window is pretty much... March, if you're, you know, a little bit warmer up until end of August. Now at the end of August, if you're in zones three through eight, you're not adding compost because you don't want to cause more growth right before it gets cold. Uh, you're just going to be adding wood chips. So I would say first, if you've got mealy bugs or scale, start with the soil, increase the natural immunities that are in your plants and let the plant try and take care of it on its own. The second thing that I would try and do is like bring in predatory insects because they're going to do a lot better work at cleaning up in a clean way uh, than you ever will be able to. So things like ladybugs, brassicoid wasp, braconid wasp, um, those are really going to come in and, you know, and help. Now, depending on what growing zone you're in, it really does depend on what plants you're going to grow to bring in ladybugs. In most growing zones, you can grow yarrow. That's fantastic. Um, for bringing in ladybugs. Worst case scenario, go to, you know, Amazon or to a local nursery and and buy live ladybugs and just let them go in your garden. Now you're, you're not going to see them all over for days and days. They're going to go eat their food. They're going to move on to the next food source, but that is a really easy way to bring things back into balance. Now the last and worst case scenario, if the scale and mealy bugs 
are doing some pretty bad irreparable damage, this is when you want to step in as a steward and go, all right, I'm going to do something natural, neem, probiotics, a little bit of basic H. Uh, measurements, I would use like a quarter teaspoon of basic H, about an ounce or a shot glass of probiotics, and like one tablespoon of neem per gallon of water. Um, and then I would use that as a foliar spray or just drench it um, in the evening. And that will usually take care of it. Now, this time of year, it's so stinking hot. The sun can actually cook some of those leaves if you don't rinse the plant plants off the next morning. So this is a tricky time of year because of the intensity of, of the sun and the placement on the horizon. So typically if I'm going to treat with neem and basic H this time of year, I'm going to be rinsing the leaves, giving it a good shower, you know, the next morning. So that way you'll be, be good to go. So question three, and again, you're welcome to use the chat window. Uh, you're welcome to ask additional questions um, in that chat window as well. And hopefully we'll have time to get to a couple of those at the end. Actually, if y'all want to just like give a thumbs up in the chat, just so I know that people are here, it says that there are people here, but I haven't seen the chat actually, you know, moving or anything yet. So question number three is about toilet paper plant. Um, so this is Plectoranthus barbatus. Toilet paper plant is um, a very highly scented uh, plant, sometimes called blue spur, but Plectoranthus barbatus um, is not native here, but the Plectoranthus species is found all over the world, both in coleuses, some of the mint family, um, Panadol is a Plectoranthus. Um, so Plectoranthus, generally speaking, are not going to be amazing uh, and usually a candidate for edible consumption. Uh, it's it's not a food, basically. It can be used medicinally, though. Primarily toilet paper plant or blue spur. Think of it as a um, really highly scented two-ply. <laughs> and I mean, it really is that. It works fantastic for that. Um, so if you're going hiking, get a, a stack of those and put them in your pack and you're, you're good to go. Uh, but practically, the uh, terpenes that are in toilet paper plant can also be rubbed all over the skin as an insect repellent. Some of the terpenes are going to be similar, uh, actually identical terpenes to uh, rosemary. So you can rub that on your skin. You will notice it has a very rosemary and smell to it. Um, so you can rub that on the skin as an insect repellent. It can also be used under arms as a deodorant and removing odors uh, on the bottoms of the feet. You can place them inside shoes that are really stinky to absorb the smell, throw them away the next day. Um, now, if you are gonna use um, toilet paper plant or the Plectoranthus barbatus, uh, orally, it can be used. There is some good research for uh, liver health, uh, stomach and gut health, and also ridding the body of parasites. Now, both because of flavor and the high intensity of the, the plant medicine, you're not taking five leaves. You're taking like a half of a leaf and putting that in a cup of tea, making a good tea with it, and then um, ingesting the tea. It's not real yummy. Um, but it really does work at soothing the gut. Um, so if you're making an herbal tea, it's, it's, to me, it's better to add a little piece of a leaf in there. I, if you've got stomach issues, Spanish needle and a little tiny piece of toilet paper plant, uh, maybe some ginger or turmeric goes a really long way. Personally, if none of those reasons for gr uh, growing the toilet paper plant existed, I would, I would literally grow it just for pollination because the flowers of blue spur are these big blue kind of salvia meets um, uh, delphinium uh, kind of flowers. So really bright blue, great pollinator, lace wings, um, the uh, swallowtails really enjoy it. So that's what I would say as far as the uh, Plectoranthus barbatus is using toilet paper plant more medicinally um, and using it topically. Um, are the, the main reasons. And then obviously the, the pollination. Now, d when you do buy toilet paper plant, make, make sure not to confuse it with Cuban oregano. They do look very similar. Toilet paper plant is going to be very soft when you touch it. You can bend the leaves over and they're not going to break. Cuban oregano, if you bend the leaves, they are going to break. And it almost has a waxy matte type finish to it instead of the fuzzier finish of the toilet paper plant. But the young leaves look very, very similar. Even when I was working in a greenhouse, people would confuse it all the time. And even the staff would label it wrong. And remember, Cuban oregano, very edible, very, very edible. Uh, great 
you know, to use in, for culinary purposes. Toilet paper plant, not so much. Not, not going to be my favorite. So number four, uh, somebody was asking about a pruning schedule. So this is a fantastic question. And it's, um, it's one of those that you get the little asterisk of, it depends. Um, I would rather teach you the basic principle, share with you the principle, and then we can get into like what plants you want to prune, prune when. So in essence, we want to basically prune all plants when they're in their most dormant phase. So if you're in zones three through eight, most of your pruning, especially on hardwoods, is going to be done pretty much February and March. Now, once that sap starts flowing, pruning is kind of over. Uh, you can do it, but it's always risky. The reason why is when that sap is flowing, moisture is, is present. And so that's going to attract fungal issues, bacteria. And so you're increasing the chance of your plant getting sick. So there are some people, and I've seen local greenhouses, I'm not going to name any names. I've seen local greenhouses saying prune your peach tree or your plum or your nectarine uh, in Florida in July or August. And I'm just going, yeah, if you're wanting your tree to be sick and diseased and to get canker and all this other stuff, yeah, you can totally do that. Now, it does depend because in places like California, now they are zone nine, but right now they're in that zone nine, it is very dry. And a lot of those trees are actually going into dormancy. They've lost their leaves. The sap is not flowing because it is a dry season. So if you're in California, this may be a good time to actually do that pruning. So that's why I like to say the general principle is we want to prune when the plant is in the most dormant state, not when the saps are flowing. The only things that I'm going to be pruning this time of year, or even actually in, in the next couple of months really, are going to be things like mango, because mango is just getting done fruiting. It's starting to enter its dormancy in August and September. So at the end of September, when rainy season is over, and mango is done fruiting, I'm probably going to be pruning things like my mango and my strawberry tree because they're going to be done fruiting for the year. Pretty much anything else, even here in Florida, I'm not pruning until after the dormancy season. So that's January, February for the most part uh, in this area. So the basic principle um, for pruning is dormancy. Whenever that, that particular plant in your particular area is dormant, that's when you want to do that. Now on the opposite side of that, Think about feeding as well. Feeding does go on a pretty pretty similar schedule. So in Florida and in zones 9 through 11, no matter where you are, we're pretty much always going to be fertilizing. And when I say fertilizing, I'm not talking about synthetics. I'm talking about soil building materials, bone meal, blood meal, fish emulsion, sea kelp, azomite, magnesium, compost, 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 things like that. Um, so when you're fertilizing or amending your soil, we're doing it in March, in June, and September. The reason why is that's the initial uh, green growth phase, uh, flowering phase, and fruiting phase for most plants. So typically speaking in zones 9 through 11, in March, you're doing high nitrogen. So that's going to be things like blood meal. Uh, in June, you're doing things that have high phosphorus. Uh, bone meal. Uh, and then in September, you're doing things that have high potassium or potash. Um, so azomite or minerals and that sort of thing, sea kelp, fish emulsion. So we want to mimic that NPK in our March, June, and September um, regimen. So if you're in zones three through eight, that's more of an April, June, and August, but it's a similar concept. April is going to be your nitrogen. June is going to be your phosphorus. And August is going to be your potassium generally speaking. So, but then again, for me, I, I do foliar sprays for feeding pretty much once a month. My foliar spray is usually sea kelp, fish emulsion, um, and probiotics once a month during the growing season, pretty much year round. And I'm a proponent of this because I'm an active participant in my ecosystem. And I cannot even tell you, because I don't remember, the last time that I had sooty mold, powdery mildew, scale, um, since I started doing this. Now, when I didn't do this, oh gosh, I mean, it was, it was more crisis management <laughs> than it was gardening. It's like at the beginning of the gardening season, I saw this meme today. It was like, beginning of gardening season, there's this 
beautiful garden and they have their tools and everything looks picture perfect. And then there was like this end of gardening season and the dude looked like super haggard and like hair all over the place. And I was like, that was pretty much me before I started gardening smarter and not trying to work harder. Um, so that's the pruning schedule. Uh, I will be also, as far as the food forest maintenance schedule, uh, during our PDF uh, week, which I believe is week two of the month, I'll be posting an updated uh, food forest maintenance guide uh, this month, as well as the tropical spinach recipes. So if you are a Patreon member um, in the abundance level, then you can look for those two uh, during week two. So I'll be posting those documents. Some of you, if I've done consultations for you, I did give you an initial food forest maintenance guide, but this will be a little bit more updated version because I'm always finding things that I would add, take out, do differently, that sort of thing. Uh, number five. So fifth question that came in through Patreon was about citrus trees. Uh, that particular patron sent me some images of the leaves. Um, those leaves in particular, if you're watching, uh, those are um, um, leaf miners. And so leaf miners are the things that there's that make those little lines that are light colored all over the leaves. Now, there are a hundred different types of uh, leaf miners. So the, the exact species that it is, I don't know. There's about four that are citrus leaf miners. Now, what those are is, is it's actually the, the larva stage of a moth. So the moth you have probably seen and not really picked up on. It's a really small, like a tan moth um, that lays its eggs in leaves that are already struggling. That's the key phrase. So that citrus tree, before it had the eggs laid inside the, uh, the leaf, it was already either nutrient deficient, it was struggling, it was not getting watered in the way that it wanted to be. Um, so one really easy way to get around leaf miners, make sure your trees are healthy, compost and wood chips, yarrow around the base, especially of citrus. Now, if you identify that you do already have leaf miners, again, I wouldn't freak out. Most citrus trees, um, except for finger lime, are probably gonna get leaf miners at some point in time. It is primarily cosmetic. I would say eight and a half times out of 10, it's cosmetic. It looks bad, but it's not going to kill your plant. If it gets out of control, again, that's where you want to step in. So what happens is when that, um, that moth lays an egg in the leaf, it lays it between the cellular layers of the leaf and sandwiches it in. And that thing is crawling around in there and the leaf is actually giving that larva protection. So if you spray your leaves, it's probably not going to soak into the leaves and actually kill the thing. Um, so you're better off focusing on predatory insects. Again, it's the um, braconid wasp, braconoid wasp. It's the ladybugs. You know, it's, it's attracting all of those good things. And then also because it's a moth, um, attract things like songbirds. So bring in bird feeders into your yard, suet cakes, uh, a good no mess bird blend to feed the birds. And they're also going to help control insects, both, you know, the, the, um, the moth or the butterfly stages, but they're going to go after, you know, worms and go after caterpillars and that sort of thing. Now, if you do have to step in, Technically, uh, pyrethrine is organic uh, and it will be effective against uh, leaf miners, but it does kill honeybees uh, and butterflies. So if you do apply that, it will last for about a week um, and, and it will topically kill the insects. So you've got to really use that as your last resort. Um, if you're on the front end of applying sprays, uh, during the spring foliar spray time, that's when those larvae are getting laid on the leaves. So if you're doing a good spring foliar spray, a lot of times you can avoid the problems later in the season because you've done a good um, spring foliar spray. Um, so that was the citrus issue in that picture. Now citrus, by and large, they just have a lot of problems. Um, the other two problems I would look for, one is greening. Every citrus tree is going to get greening at some point in time. Uh, it's <clears throat> just part of having citrus. Um, so citrus to me is like a long-term uh, or a short-term perennial rather. So it's not going to last forever. It's going to last you three, four, five, seven years, 
probably not longer than that anymore. It's going to get greening and there is no actual cure for greening. The best thing you can do with a citrus, plant it on the southwest side of an oak tree because there's some good research you have finally put out a good study on it that the tannins from the oak leaves in the soil will act as a natural preventative for greening. It's only about 80% effective, but that's still 80% better than planting a citrus tree out in the middle of a field or doing an, a citrus only orchard. Stupid, stupid mistakes. Um, and yet universities were telling us to do it over the last 20 years. Um, so the way that you can see if you do have greening on your leaf, if you've got blotchiness on the leaf, like light spots that are not symmetrical, that is probably going to be greening. If you have light spots that are symmetrical, like the veins on the leaf are lighter colored or are darker colored, that's going to be a nutrient deficiency. Uh, or if the leaves are turning all white, especially the new growth, that's going to be a nutrient deficiency. But in the image that the uh, patron sent to me, that in particular was a leaf minor um, problem. Question number six, we've got uh, three more questions after that. Uh, what are the must-dos for a homestead? Um, I do get into this a lot in uh, the, the permaculture design course, which if you are on Patreon, you will get an early registration and a discount code for that if you want to do it. Once you've taken your PDC with me, you are always welcome to come back and do the PDC again at no charge at all. So every PDC is going to be different, even taught by the same instructor, because the host sites are going to be different. The projects are going to be slightly different. Um, so you are always welcome um, to come back for those. But I would say the two primary things, if you've got a new homestead that I would do the moment I buy, one is get aerial views. So a couple of ways you can go about doing this. One. You can hire someone that has a drone, get some great drone footage, video, or snapshots. Or two, get on your local GIS. So type in Lake County or Tuscola County or Jackson County GIS, the Geological Information Surveys, and that can give you an overhead view of your site. And it will also give you the contour lines of the slope of your site, which is amazingly helpful. Second thing that I would do is establish really good and secure perimeters. Um, and I'm not just talking about fencing. I'm talking about where is the family mostly going to be at? Is there areas that are safe for kids? Are there areas that are safe for animals and livestock? Is the area well lit? So I've got a perimeter checklist. So if you are interested in that in Patreon, um, just add it in as a comment. Um, and I can go ahead and, and send that out um, on Patreon as well um, in week two. Question seven, um, how do you merge the garden, the vegetable garden, and the food forest like in an agroforestry system? That is a fantastic question. So agroforestry, if you're new uh, with that, is basically a food forest in a line. So you've got like a fruit tree, berry bush, nitrogen fixer, fruit tree, berry bush, nitrogen fixer that are kind of going on in repeat. Now, in the first couple years of a food forest, the canopy is small enough that you have a lot of room on the bottom to really add in annual vegetables. Now, you're not going to have that forever. By year three to five, the canopy is going to be so thick and dense in those rows. The annual vegetable space is going to be pretty small. But in your first one, two, three years, add in down at the base in between those layers as much as humanly possible. So yes, you can absolutely take the items that are in the gardening list that I uh, published and the items in the food forest list and kind of merge those together. Now, that brings to your second question. This is question number eight. Uh, what is the best mulch to use in an agroforestry system? Now, if you are going to be really annual vegetable heavy, you're doing tomatoes, basil, you're doing uh, eggplants, you're doing kale and collard greens, you're probably going to want to um, use some good compost um, maybe even some straw, leaf clippings, that sort of thing next, and then your wood chips on top. The challenge with wood chips, if you only use them in agroforestry without using compost, leaves, uh, uh, leaf litter, grass clippings, straw, that sort of thing, uh, wood chips, when they decompose, are going to tie up the nitrogen. It's like a Roth IRA. So they're going to hold it back a little bit before they give it back to you. Uh, and annual vegetables need that nitrogen. So if you're doing agroforestry, you are going to have to supplement that nitrogen until the um, 
until they decompose, the wood chips decompose a little bit. If you want a really fast and easy way to do the nitrogen, if you're doing a foliar spray, fish emulsion is great. If you're wanting to amend topically on the soil, uh, blood meal would be the next one that I would do. And always with bone and blood meal, follow the directions. I, ooh, I when I was in Kansas City, I still, I'm, I'm so triggered by this right now. When I was in Kansas City, I was like, oh, I'm going to amend with blood meal uh, and bone meal, kind of build up my soil a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more. I didn't quite double it but I added more than what I should have because my soil was really depleted. It will burn your plants. And I ended up with like a dead garden bed because it does burn the plants. So don't add too much too fast. It's better to do a little bit, wait for a week, do a little bit more, wait for a week, do a little bit more, follow those instructions that are on there because every um, fish emulsion is going to be a little bit different. The blood meal is going to be different depending on the source of the blood and that sort of thing. So last question, and then if you have any in the uh, in the chat, then uh, we can answer those as well. So the last question for our Q&A that we got from patrons are, how do you manage rodent issues? This is always going to be a problem um, if you're doing agroforestry. It's always going to be. If you have a garden, there's going to be rodents. So the best thing that we can do is remember we are one part of the ecosystem. And as orchestrators or conductors of this orchestra, we get to help bring things back into balance so that way there is a, a grand crescendo, which is hopefully a good harvest. So I would say, one, consider what the predator is naturally of that pest. If you've got a mice or a rat problem, snakes or a cat. I don't like doing cats. I would rather do snakes. I don't like doing cats because cats will also kill wild songbirds. And I would much rather have the wild songbirds. I never let cats go in the garden. So think of what the natural predators are. A lot of insects, the natural predators are the braconid, brassicoid, and ladybugs. And even the, uh, what do they call them? I'm doing flick charades. Praying mantises. So praying, <laughs> praying mantises is another good one to attract to the garden. And you can actually buy uh, praying mantis egg sacs and just put them in your garden and let them hatch and you will have what, thousands and thousands of them. Now, you're not going to have them stay on your property, but they will initially be there and they'll, they'll do their job um, accordingly. So second thing you can do is consider what plants to put in the ground that will help with those, um, those rodent or pest issues. Plants are only going to do a small area. So people a lot of times will plant um, lemongrass or citronella to repel mosquitoes. It does work if you're rubbing it all over your skin. It does work if you're sitting in a five, six foot area around that plant. Beyond that, plants are not really going to be that beneficial. Now, things like Panadol, um, that's Plectoranthus canis, canis roth um, is the botanical name. Panadol in Australia, it's known as a uh, scaredy cat uh, plant works great for rats, for mice, for um, raccoons, for possums. It does spread. Um, it's not invasive, but it does spread. Um, I love using that at the base of fruit trees like avocados because it keeps those stupid possums from getting all of my avocados. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. I also use Panadol around the potting shed or the feed sheds because it keeps the rats and mice from getting in the feed sheds. If you have an RV or a boat park somewhere, planting the Panadol around the base uh, does work really well. The one downside to Panadol is it really smells like weed. So just be aware of that when you plant it, that if you're doing it around an area that has a lot of um, foot traffic, even when you water it, it's gonna make the area smell like cannabis. You could do other things like mint or thyme or oregano, um, but they're not going to be quite as effective as things like Panadol or uh, lemongrass. So the third way to control uh, rodents, my favorite kind of a trap, especially for rats and for mice, is called a bucket trap. So it's literally, you can buy them pre-made on Amazon. It's a lid that has a little trap door on it, and there's a ramp that comes down. So the, the rats and mice will go up to the bucket, you put some feed on one side, they go across and they fall down into the bucket. I fill the bucket with soapy water uh, because I want to euthanize them as quickly as possible. Um, and literally, I've, I've had problems in barns before with rats or mice. You put a plant trap or a, a five-gallon bucket uh, trap in there, 
and you might get 20 rats in a night. And I know that sounds disgusting, but I would rather take care of them that way than having to clean out traps all the time. I never, ever use sticky traps because that is absolute torture for the animals. Snap traps I don't love because you have to touch them in between every single use. Um, so if you're going to put gloves on and wash in between, great, more power to you. But honestly, the, the bucket trap for me has hands down been the most successful. And honestly, the other thing with, with rodent issues is just keep the area clean. Keep it really, really clean. So if you drop some feed on the ground, uh, bird seed or whatever, clean it up. You know, if you clean the area, remove their food source the best that you can. Um, they're not going to be there as much. Um, and so that really does, that does help. Um, so those are the nine questions that came in through Patreon. I'll give you another, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so. If there's any other questions, you want to add those um, into the chat. Otherwise, what we'll end up doing is I'll export this video. I'll be posting it on YouTube and posting a link for uh, patrons to be able to refer to uh, later, uh, but it will also be a public link for other people to join in. So if you are watching this right now on YouTube, um, if you are interested in being a part of these lives, asking gardening questions, and getting more of a mentorship approach to permaculture, food forestry, and gardening, then I would encourage you to check out our Patreon community. There's a link for that in the link tree in the bio. So it looks like we've already addressed um, all of the questions that we had for this month. Hopefully this was helpful to you, uh, gave you some uh, things to think about. Um, and again, as we post this video on YouTube, if you have other things that you would like to add, suggestions, things that you would do differently, please, please um, share those in the comments. I, I love continuing to learn and continuing to grow. Um, I'm actually reading a really good book on um, Anasazi herbalism. It uh, has a lot of great scientific sources, um, some uh, amazing references and stuff in it. And I have learned so much uh, by reading this, this herbalism book. I'm a master herbalist already, but I'm still continuing to learn as time goes on. Um, I have questions in the question section. Are you talking about question section on this or questions in, um, in Patreon? If you're talking about Patreon, give me one second and I'll see if I can bring that up here really fast. See if I can see the questions there. Or if you're able just to copy and paste those into the chat, that's great too. One second, I'm not seeing any that are in Patreon that have showed up for me anyway. Yeah, I'm not seeing any in Patreon here. Uh, any suggestions for keeping armadillo um, from digging in the wood chips? Yeah, armadillos, that's a hard one. The armadillos, as cool looking as they are, they really, they dig a lot, they make a lot of mess, and they are very disease prone. Um, so that is pretty challenging as well. Um, so you can, the best thing that you can do is use like tack strips um, that you put on the ground. They have very sensitive pads to their feet. Now, if you have a cat or a dog, that may be a problem. The other thing you can do is sprinkle um, chili powder or cayenne pepper on the ground, and that will also uh, hurt the bottoms of their feet. Um, Q&A section on Cloudcast. Oh my gosh, look at that. Okay, so let's see, start answering. That's weird. It shows that there are questions that I'm not seeing what the question actually is. That one. I think I've got all of them. I don't see anything else that I'm missing other than the armadillo question. So if I missed any more, go ahead and ask that in the chat here, and then I'll go ahead and, and hit on those. But I think we got it. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I will uh, be posting a couple times for you Patreons uh, this coming week. Um, I'll be actually posting tomorrow the uh, schedule for the rest of the month so you know when those are going to be hitting the Patreon account. So thanks so much for joining tonight. Have fun. And as usual, stay in the garden.